Welcome to another episode of Planetary Makeover. I'm Gina Blickenstaff and I am delighted to be today's guest and grateful to our producers Francis Oman, Mark Spilker, and David Minot for all the work they have done to create this wonderful show. I am a lifelong professional artist, I'm a spiritual minded person, and I'm an activist. I was uh, born and raised in New York, so I have a big New York mouth. <laughs> and I like to get on my soapbox occasionally, and so I have created venues for this sharing. <laughs> I share through my art, and I share through public talks and events. I share through social media. I share through my YouTube channel. Um, and I share through articles I have written. In this episode, the producers and I have decided to share some clips with you from some of my outflows. <laughs> my outflows. <laughs> Um, to give you a good snapshot of how this information that we share on Planetary Makeover has affected my life, um, has worked out in my life. And that subject is the momentous emergence of my Tray of the World teacher into our lives. I found out about this information when I was 26 in 1982 and I had uh, an extraordinary experience at a lecture by Benjamin Krem that I was basically dragged to and I didn't want to go. <laughs> and then a few years later, I had another extraordinary experience um, after asking conviction of whether or not this information was true. And um, I will share those with you. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our guest this week. That's Gina Blickenstaff. Am I saying that right, Gina? <laughs> yes, very good. <laughs> and as you can tell from what she has shared with us, she's going to be taking us on a captivating journey through her own wonderland of great art, gardening, spirituality, uplifting humanity, revelations, and did I mention great art? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, hello, yeah. Gina, and welcome to the show. Thank you, David. It's really nice to be here. And at this point, with that little bit of an intro, is there anything you'd like to add to your own introduction to your show? Uh, sure. Well, I left a, a couple little hangers there, um, the two experiences that I mentioned um, at the lecture in 1982 that I was dragged to. Um, I was just sitting in the audience and um, I've never had visions ever in my whole life, but when um, Benjamin Krem uh, would give a lecture at the beginning, he would just sit in uh and give a blessing from Maitreya. Maitreya would overshadow him and uh, Ben would look at everybody in the audience, but it was Maitreya looking through him and he would, uh, Maitreya would give a blessing to all these people in the audience. It was very, very powerful. And um, at that time, that was my first experience of it, I was, the whole room changed like this sort of rose color. Everything felt like it was like really still and far away, like you could hear a pin drop. And everybody in the row in front of me had this sort of um, fluorescent, not fluorescent. Um, oh, what's the word? Um, Iridescent? Iridescent, very good, thank you. Uh, outline over them and it was sort of pulsating and I've never seen anything like that before in my life and I also saw Benjamin Krem's face turning strange I didn't know what it was and I found out uh 
later that I was actually seeing some of Maitreya's face superimposed on his face. And because many people over the years, they've said they've seen uh, Benjamin Krem just disappear in, in this Maitreya standing in his place during these blessings. So that was the first strange experience I had. And besides that, I was really taken with Benjamin Krem's uh, words and his um, integrity. And I was just sitting on the edge of my chair the whole time because it filled in this empty space in my life that I didn't even know I had, <laughs> which was uh, being of service to humanity. It was a concept I was never taught when I was young. And uh, it everything he said just sort of made sense to me. And then I started, after that, I started meditating, doing this service meditation called transmission meditation with the local group. And I noticed that they were sort of mo more dedicated to this information about Maitreya and the masters coming into the world than I was. I didn't really have conviction. So I asked for conviction. And when Benjamin Krem came into town that year, um, because the group sponsored him and would uh, facilitate a lecture, public lecture and a public meditation. And then there was a private meditation and I was participating in this private meditation. And in the middle, like two hours into the meditation, um, I was just completely overcome with this tremendous energy um, and I've meditated my whole life since I was 15 and I know what it feels like to have my own soul energy in my space, but this was, this was somebody else in my space. It was the most bizarre feeling. And I mean, my chest expanded, I couldn't breathe and there was tears coming down my face. And, um, there were two major keynotes to that experience. And one was that it was the most extraordinary experience of unconditional love. Um, we say we have it on this level. I mean, just any kind of love we say, you know, I love you, I love you, but it's nothing <laughs> compared to what a master has, you know, it was, I felt like I was completely invisible, like not invisible, see-through. And this being that was in my space knew every single little thing about me and it was okay with him. <laughs> I felt this tremendous love no matter what I did in my life and how bad I was or <laughs> anything. I was like, okay with him. And then the other thing I, I remember, uh, I felt was that I, his energy was familiar. And he says in his messages, um, I have taught you, I'm an old friend, I've taught you many times before, and that's exactly what I felt. So those two things changed the trajectory of my life completely. So there you go. There's the two things. <laughs> well, that certainly sounds life-changing. Yes. Now we have a um, another clip of you talking more about this, going in more in-depth into your influences and the books you've read and how it's impacted your art. So we're going to move on to see more of both the serious and sometimes the silly side of Jean. Uh-oh. <laughs> as, she, as she breaks down both her influences and her muses. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> so we're going to take a look at how you work and play and how the two are often one. Uh-oh. Okay. <laughs> I want to share with you um, thing, some things that are of paramount importance to me, and that has to do with the journey on the spiritual path. I have mentioned that I'm a student of the Ageless Wisdom teachings, um, and if you've seen uh, other videos of mine, you may have heard me say that, but I want to just share with you some of the books I've read and still read that are writings which contain the ageless wisdom teachings so that if you are interested you can 
explore these further. To start this little subject of my spiritual path, I'm just going to show you these pictures of Maitreya, the world teacher that I have mentioned, as he appeared at a prayer gathering in Nairobi, Kenya in 1988. This woman in blue is named Mary Akatsa, and she was holding her usual prayer gathering in this being uh, in this white robe just appeared out of the blue in her midst and spoke in perfect Swahili for about 15 minutes outlining his teachings. A whole circle of people fell to their knees yelling Jesu Jesu because they thought he was Jesus Christ and many were healed and walked off without their crutches. Some people wet their pants. <laughs> Um, this was written up in the Kenya Times, and it was run on CNN. Um, and since that time, he has made numerous appearances around the world. So uh, this is Benjamin Krem, who I have talked about over the years. He's my spiritual mentor. He was. He passed away several years ago at the age of 92, I think. He traveled around the world tirelessly, bringing... This message of Maitreya's em emergence into the world. Um, mentioned. These series of blue books are the Alice Bailey books. This was an installment of the Ageless Wisdom teachings from the 1800s, along with um, writings by... Um, H.P. Blavatsky, she wrote The Secret Doctrine, and uh, they were dictated by a master. Um, these were dictated by the master D.K., also uh, his name is Dwal Kool. He's very well known in esoteric circles. M my um, favorite books, which I have lots of <laughs> bookmarks in, our uh, Discipleship in the New Age, Volume 1 and 2. And these are actually letters that were written by the Master D.K. to a number of his disciples. And I found them very moving to read and showed the great compassion of a master towards his students. Um, this is my other favorite one. It's called A Treatise on White Magic. And you can see I have that one <laughs> bookmarked seriously. These are all basically books that explain the spiritual path and how to be a disciple in the world and overcoming glamour, learning detachment, uh, lots and lots of things. In fact, there's one book here, which is called Ponder on This, which I think is great because it's a compilation. Um, you can look any kind of subject you want and there will be excerpts from the different books on that subject so you can read little snippets on different subjects. Now Benjamin Krem's books, um, these are contemporary edition of the Ageless Wisdom teachings and these are in a format, question and answer format, very easy to read. Um, Maitreya's Mission, Volume 1, 2, and 3. Um, he has a number of books, The Art of Cooperation, uh, The Awakening of Humanity, Unity and Diversity, The Gathering of the Forces of Light, UFOs, The Art of Living, and um, the Master DK dicted, dictated this one through Alice Bailey, The Reappearance of the Christ, and Benjamin Krem wrote a book called The Reappearance of the Christ and the Masters of Wisdom. So um, it's very exciting information and a message of hope for mankind. Well, that certainly gives us an intro, Gina, both into your readings and your world. And taking a look at all those books and all those tabs, I have a lot of reading to do. <laughs> you. So I think I'll get to it as soon as the show is over. All right. Now that that's quite a, a heady brand of influences that you have there, Gina. 
Uh, yes. that to Benjamin Krem and everything in between. Well, it just covers a broad subject. The whole thing is massively broad. So who needs to read anybody else? <laughs> I mean, I do read Krishnamurti, you know, and I read Agni Yoga books. And well, I don't read Krish Krishnamurti too much because his mind is like abstract. And I don't have an abstract bone in my body. So I have a hard time understanding his wording. Um, I love Eckhart Tolle's work too. I mean, I just want to inject Eckhart Tolle into my veins so I could remember what he says. <laughs> but, you know, the ageless wisdom teachings have always had the ring of truth for me. And um, it's kind of my go-to series. I got to still catch up with you on my uh, Helena um, Rorich uh, reading as well. So it was Blavatsky, then Rorich, then Benjamin Krem, and Bailey first. Oh, Bailey, that's right. Sorry. <laughs> and then Benjamin, and now it's in our hands. Okay, yes. And um, you mentioned too, uh, Krishnamurti, for our audience members that aren't familiar, that's Jiddu Krishnamurti, mm -hmm. A-I-D-D-U Krishnamurti. And he was a teacher from India who was discovered by the Theosophical Society, which Elena Blavatsky helped form. Mm -hmm. And they were grooming him to be the new world teacher, but he declined. Right. And he, his teacher was Maitreya, who you've mentioned and I have. And I think Maitreya must have said something along the lines of, that's okay, you do what you want, I'll handle this. And he lived until 1986 and wrote quite a number of books. And they're also on DVD. You can find them online and listen to him speak. And his work is abstract, as Gina pointed out, and can be difficult for us to fathom because of his level of development. Right. One of the, yeah, so one of the things we'll we just want to mention quickly in the Aegis Wisdom teaching, they talk about four levels of expanded consciousness that humanity goes through. It's sort of an artificial division, but it's good for our understanding. First, second, third, and fourth initiation First is where you get control of the appetites of the physical body. The second is when you become mentally polarized and have control over the mind. At the third initiation, the soul begins to speak directly through the personality. And then at the fourth initiation, the soul is no longer needed and the spirit speaks directly through the personality. Uh, this is all to say that Krishnamurti was a fourth degree initiate, which mm -hmm. is extraordinary. And as Gina pointed out, makes it difficult to understand him. Can but I add a little something to that? Because yes. um, I people don't really understand the whole overshadowing thing. And I understand it as the overshadowing of a disciple is the age old way of a master incarnating. So the um, Buddha overshadowed his disciple, the Prince Gautama, and then the Prince Gautama was known as uh, Gautama Buddha after that. And the same relationship was with um, Maitreya, who is the Christ, overshadowing his disciple, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, and ever you know, for those three years that he was overshadowing Jesus, Jesus was known as Jesus Christ because they were working together. And I believe that that's what was the plan with Krishnamurti is that Maitreya was going to overshadow Krishnamurti, but he declined, as you said. Um, and I actually, um, one of the articles I wrote was about this overshadowing and uh, kind of expressed it in a kind of humorous way in my Oh My God series. Uh, articles. Maybe we'll discuss that later. Yes, yes. We want to get back to that. Let's make a mental note of your, um, it's 10 art articles, right? In the o OMG series. 
Mm-hmm. Well, before we get into your painting process, Gina, let's just give our audience a little background on what you and I have made reference to, the ageless wisdom teaching. Now, this is a body of teaching that is said to be some 100,000 years old. And don't worry, it's non-denominational, though it seems to undergird, uh, to um, be beneath and part of the structure of our religious traditions, our cultural traditions, as well as our art and spirituality. And this information that we're talking about is the modern version, which only came about or was brought to mankind's attention in around 1875 um, by the Russian woman, Helena Blavatsky. And she helped start with others, the Theosophical Society, which you may have heard of. And she was mentally overshadowed by one of the masters of wisdom. The masters of wisdom are humanity's elder brothers. And their leader is Maitreya, the world teacher. Now, they're non-denominational, as I mentioned, like the Aegis Wisdom teaching. They're not looking for followers, and they don't want you to believe in them. So everything I'm saying here, technically, you can let in one ear and out the other, unless it interests you, unless it resonates with you. So as I said, in the modern age, we started with Helena Blavatsky. And she was overshadowed by one of the masters of wisdom. And after Madame Blavatsky, there was Helena Rorick in the early 20th century. And she gave to the world the Agni Yoga teachings, amongst others. After her came Alice A. Bailey from around 1919 to 1949. And also created a huge body of work many books also while being overshadowed by the master dk for short and after alice in the mid 20th century mid to late came along benjamin krem an artist esotericist and author and he presented a more modern version which is also an easier read than blavatsky rorick or Bailey. And Ben just passed in 2016. He worked on this project for more than 40 years. Actually, more like 50 years, if you count all of his work. And today, this is informing Gina's work. And Gina has talked about the uh, books that she's read and those same authors. And Now we're going to try and put this in a larger context. In other words, how this is affecting you in the world today. What is its relevance? And Gina's going to talk more about that and what good news this is for humanity and how, once again, this is not belief-based. You can let it go in one ear and out the other. And one more point I'd like to quickly make is the evolutionary progress of human beings. And it's sort of artificially divided into four steps or initiations, as we call them. The first initiation is when we get control over the appetites of the physical body. And it's many, tends to be many thousands of lifetimes before we get to that point. After that, the process speeds up considerably. Then there is the second initiation when we get control over the emotional body over our emotions also being uh, known as the beginnings of mental polarization and then at the third initiation the soul of the individual which is hanging around right up here begins to speak directly through the personality which is quite stunning And the fourth degree, the fourth initiation, is where the spirit begins to speak 
directly through the personality. The soul is no longer needed, gets absorbed back up into the monad or monad or spirit. And as I said, the spirit is speaking directly through the personality, which is absolutely stunning. After that, after those four steps, then comes the fifth when you can leave the earth school. It has nothing more to teach you. You become a perfected human being like the masters of wisdom and you can leave the planet and go on many other, many other paths, which is another study in itself. Or you can stick around here and help out some of your younger brothers and sisters as about 40 or so masters in total will be doing in this, the Aquarian age that we're in now. And with that, I'd like to move on to listening to Gina discussing my process. Uh, let's see. I guess best way to explain that would be to say that I, I want to create a healthy body and a healthy mind and a healthy emotional body. And I want to connect with my soul spiritually. And so my routine um, involves some um, serious meditation, which I've done since I was 15. I meditate every morning and every evening, and I would highly recommend it because I think it completely helps us access the soul energy and that's all creative and all loving and all wise and all beautiful and all that stuff can come down into your art if you let it and if you don't clog yourself up with drugs and smoking and alcohol and all kinds of stuff i'm pretty pure that way i'm a vegan and so i um i think it's very important it's all about vibration for me and i think the the more we concentrate on increasing our vibration into a finer vibration by our diet and our practices in life or, you know, the, the more our paintings and our creative aspects or music or writing, whatever, they vibrate with a finer vibration. And I think that's really important because I think our general goal in life as human beings is to spiritualize matter so you know take all this heavy awful evil matter and sort of work it like dough <laughs> or clay or something and just keep infusing it with light and find the beauty in things and infuse it and lighten it up and because we're all made of atoms of light and we can change things if we try well, that gives you a little bit of a peek into how Gina operates, but she's going to tell us a little more. And I'm wondering, Gina, how many other artists like ourselves have considered the impact of meditation upon their art? It's been my experience, and apparently yours too, that there is no downside to it. Uh, no, I mean, I can't see how there would ever be any downside to meditation. Um, because when you're uh, meditating, you're building what they call the Antakarana, which is the bridge from the mind to the soul. Um, and just over the years, you're just like you're putting a little brick <laughs> every day when you meditate on this bridge and making a big, long you know, pathway to your soul. And it just gets stronger and stronger over the years and you become more intuitive and you become more uh, vibrant. Somehow the light just pours through you. And, you know, some people um, ask me how I do things and sometimes I can't figure out how I do things because I'm sort of in another... <laughs> place when I'm painting it's just flowing you know um so and I just know you know I started meditating when I was 15 so it's just this automatic 
outflow now. And I would recommend this to anyone. And I do with my vlog episodes, I'm always promoting meditation as a way to become more spiritual and more creative and more loving everything. And I consider it my, my safe space. You know, I went through a real existential crisis not long ago and I was actually kind of suicidal for a couple of years. And I just meditated a lot because it was the only place I felt home. And I believe whenever we have problems, the answers are within. So that's the place to go. <laughs> if you need answers, or you need help or you need a safe space to me. So it seems as though meditation holds the key or the keys, uh, Gina, to what humanity holds most dear. Mm -hmm. As you just mentioned, home and also inspiration, insight, intuition, which you mentioned, um, improved health, uh, an enhancing of the love nature, mm -hmm. balance, creativity, and much more. Exactly. Exactly. I can't add anything to that. I mean, it's basically, you know, an umbrella <laughs> for everything that you want to create in your life, you know, from in, in the way of growth, spiritual growth. And, and umbrellas come in handy when it rains. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so when, when life is difficult, it can help us through it, which you demonstrated viscerally yourself mm -hmm. through that change of life um, that was very stressful. And the meditation helped you make it through and look where you are today. And I just want to add, if I may, that the umbrella thing, um, I've always used that umbrella as a a way to describe you know when when you evolve spiritually you become more sensitive to all the needs in the world you know it uh, it's hard because it's painful you become more sensitive to the suffering in the world and you just want to help everyone and everything you know i i want to help the homeless i want to help the animals and you know, all these things, but I realized that there are a lot of people doing those things already, helping the homeless and helping the animals. And there's not as many people being crazy like me and all these others in this, you know, who know, uh, telling people that the Christ is in the world again. And I decided that when people really embrace this information as the reality, which we all think it is, they will, and they, and they follow his teachings, which as you mentioned before, honesty of mind, sincerity of spirit and detachment, they will become more loving and they will take care of all those things that matter to me. Like the, they will house the homeless and they will take care of the suffering animals and they will do all of these things because they will just be radiating love and so i see you know doing this work to bring attention to my trade's emergence is like an umbrella because you know once he comes out is more visible in our public lives then we will all jump on the bandwagon and learn to be more loving and that will solve all the problems that bother me <laughs> Indeed, it will it will help when it rains. Mm -hmm. and, and speaking of that type of energy, perhaps we should show your next clip, which illustrates your Hand of God series. And that made me think of that old African-American spiritual. He's got the whole world in his hands. <laughs> right, right. I'm going to share with you a segment from a Kickstarter promotional video that I did about seven years ago. It features an explanation of some of my figurative paintings. Um, for those who have not followed my career, uh, I am a figure painter as well as a still life and landscape painter. And over the years, I have created a number of works that were in a Hands of God series. Uh, I, I did the series to sort of uh, inspire people to think about 
the power they have in their hands and how they use their hands, um, how they express love through their hands, how they express compassion, um, and you know the power basically that they have in their hands to affect change in the world and affect the relationships in their lives. <laughs> this first painting is called Wisdom. This was done many, many years ago. Um, it's the first, basically, that I consider to be in this series, even though I didn't invent the series <laughs> until, you know, later. Uh, but I can see that now it's part of the series. And um, this has to do with uh, gifts that we are given from above, so to speak. It's this recognition of a higher force, you know, blessing us with bits of wisdom and you know um, healing and awareness and I think we're given a lot of these pearls of wisdom but they sort of bounce off of us because we're not paying attention or we're purposely ignoring them or we don't understand or we're just being oblivious um, and I feel like this painting represents you know a pearl of wisdom there's a pearl in her fingertips an angel's fingertips this is a pearl of wisdom that I'm recognizing and that I'm taking and it's a personal painting one of my first major personal paintings um, the next painting is called uh, a new day for humanity and this painting is about sharing the resources of the world um, in this painting the mother represents the developed nations of the world and she's sharing her bounty this food this oranges and things on the table with her child, uh, her member of her family, who represents the undeveloped nations of the world. And the light pouring in through the curtains basically represents a symbolic of the light pouring into the world right now because I believe we're, we're coming into a time of a spiritual awakening and uh, that's what that light represents in this painting. I can add a tiny bit to that that I didn't say in the video. By all means. Um, well, this, like I said, this was a Kickstarter uh, project I submitted and some people aren't ready to hear anything about my Tray of the World teacher or my Tray of the Christ is in, you know, Christ in the world, all that. And so I sort of left that out and in that painting i actually painted maitreya as the little statue who's the flute player as he says in one of his messages i'm i am the flute player and then the light coming in through the curtains is the light coming from him and the masters of wisdom who are coming with him into the world so that's just a little added bit about that painting well thank you and that that painting is uh really stunning thank and you. What about our viewers who would like to see more of your work? Where can they go to see that? Well, I've had a website forever. It's just my name.com, ginablickenstaff.com. I also have a whole bunch of stuff on Instagram. And I don't know what my handle is on Instagram. It's just gina.blickenstaff or gina-blickenstaff or something. I also have a Facebook account. <laughs> I'm doing it and my YouTube channel, but you know, that really just has my uh, video episodes of this video I started called The Get Go. And that actually is really fun because it has um, a lot of uh, live, not well live, they're, they're not live, but they're recorded um, uh, segments of me actually painting. So it's kind of a little bit of a teaching venue for me, as well as uh, just bringing awareness to my art and all the fun stuff I do in my life. It seems to me, Gina, that you're trying to do more, much more here actually, than just paint pretty pictures and tell a story through your art. You're actually fashioning a path to a better world and inviting us to join you there. Well, that's always the hope, you know, I mean, uh, Benjamin Krem has always said that um, 
the royal road to spiritual evolution is service and meditation. So we don't want to do a whole lot of heavy duty meditation like in the the group service meditation that many of us do called transmission meditation. If you just bring in all this heavy duty spiritual energy and it doesn't go out into the world as service work, you know, you can make yourself sick actually it's like it clogs up or something <laughs> it's it, it really needs to come in and go out you know we're meant to share those energies and it's really important to keep that in mind so i can't help but you know spread everything around that i think is good <laughs> and you know i annoy people doing it too you know but it's just who i am and i'm in my 60s now and there's not a lot of time left in this life to just say it like it is so i'm just letting it all hang out <laughs> well if that's annoyance gina we need more of it and <laughs> you brought up something i hadn't thought about in a while that we have to express those energies mm -hmm. coming from the soul mm -hmm. into our personality vehicles you know the mind the body and, and the emotions because if we don't as you pointed out, that energy rattles around inside us and can cause mental right. or physical or emotional problems. Right. And, um, well, I guess we're looking for a way to, as you described, as you put the title of this last clip we're going to show, anchor the light, both in yourself and in the world. And let's... Um, Let's take a let's take a gander at that, shall we? And this should bring us full circle. This subject of light is in relation to the things going on in the world is quite a vast subject, and I'm gonna do the best I can to give you a little sound bite. Um if you're not interested, please skip to the next section. If you are interested, I'll try to put links uh, for more information. Uh, so I will begin on this uh, anchoring the light subject that I want to share with you. After the mass shooting in Boulder in March, I created this vlog episode and in it I mentioned you know to, in order to deal with the stress in the world and the violence to do our best to anchor the light and I got a really good response from people who thought that phrase was very moving to them so that's why I'm um, going to enlarge on this a little bit. I am a student of the Ageless Wisdom teachings. I have been for many, many years. So what I'm going to share with you is based on that frame of reference. So if it's upsetting to you, um, please just skip. <laughs> Our mainstream media is focused on sensationalistic news and depressing news and scary news. And we are being bombarded with this negativity. But there are are a lot of really good things happening in the world that of course we don't have the benefit of knowing about because it doesn't sell news you know like the scary stuff does um i have a, a sort of interesting take on some of the trends that are going on now which are more helpful viewpoint and so i just wanted to share that with you for your own uh, consideration if it helps you to think of some positive versions of the uh, stress in the world. I'm going to do my best. I took notes. <laughs> it's impossible to get this big subject in a little tiny sound bite. Okay, so there are two really big things that I think are contributing to the commotion in the world and the main one I believe is that we are moving into the age of Pisces I'm sorry the age of Aquarius 
from the age of Pisces, which we've been in for 2,500 years. In the new age, we will also be in for about 2,500 years, the age of Aquarius. While these energies are overlapping, which is where we are now, it causes friction because the energies of the Piscean age conflict with the energies of the Piscean uh, Aquarian age. Um, the characteristics of the energy of Pisces are to do with, with individualism and idealism, and it creates a sense of uh, separativeness and um, sometimes righteousness, devotion. The energies of Aquarius have to do with synthesis and brotherhood, and it's that energy which wants to bring people together, uh, have them work together in groups. So the energies are very diametrically opposed, and you will find that people who are aligned with the Piscean energy are really scared of losing their footing. They can feel their way of life sort of fading and the new energy coming in. So they're hanging on for dear life. <laughs> And this is creating a lot of the polarization in the world and the violence, actually. So this is a really huge thing that's going on, which is pulling us in both directions a lot of the time. The other main thing is um, that um, my experience has led me to believe that the world teacher is in our midst and this world teacher has come into our lives he's still incognito for the time being and sort of waiting in the wings for the right opportunity to emerge publicly um, when we have taken the necessary steps to bring in the new time he will come forward and add his help He's already helping daily, hourly, by the second. Um, but he's doing it incognito. At some point in the near future, hopefully, <laughs> he will be fully visible and fully working uh, with us to guide us and show us the way forward. And he's come with a number of his uh, advanced disciples who are called the Masters of Wisdom or the Great White Brotherhood, or our Elder Brothers. There's many names for this group of advanced men. So they are working together with Maitreya, and it Maitreya is uh, the world teacher's personal name. He is the one, the one that all religions await. He's the head of our spiritual hierarchy, a uh, very, very advanced being, and He's pouring his love into the world as the masters are, and it creates upset. Um, it's very powerful energy, and it tends to divide people. The light is shining into every corner. People can't hide. <laughs> A lot going on in that regard. And if you want in more information about that, there's a very comprehensive website called share-international.org, which you can go to and read all kinds of stuff. I've been following this information for almost 40 years. So talk about anchoring the light. We can anchor the light too in whatever way we can, whatever way we're good at, whatever way we love. If you're a painter like me, you can anchor it doing your painting or through your music or your writing or your meditations or your contemplations of nature and your love of nature or your love of helping others. All of that goodwill is anchoring the light. And this is the best way that I know to get through this difficult time. There are dark forces at play, you know, trying to hold us by the throats. <laughs> Big money is trying to choke us to death. But we have the power of light behind us and love that's in our hearts. 
Maitreya is connected with everyone through the heart. And this is very, very powerful. And we can use our minds, this wisdom, this light, to make very intelligent moves and stay above the emotional duress. Uh, even though I know all of this information, I still give in to the fear occasionally and want to hide under the bed, and that's okay. <laughs> so just do your best. Um, stand steady in the light. Anchor the light, and we will get through this, and we will come out the other side with a big smile on our face. <laughs> but before we go, there's a couple more things I want to uh, mention the internet is leveling the playing field in an interesting way because middlemen are being not needed as much as they used to. Like for me, being an artist, I don't particularly need a gallery to sell my work. I can go directly to my audience. Um, middlemen everywhere are being jumped over because people all over the world now can go right to the people that are interested in their products or their business or their whatever they're selling or you know everybody's <laughs> trying to make a living these days so um, and I think this is a really great thing because it's giving people control over their lives and a voice that they didn't have before and um, that also leads me to my other point about there's just this cry from all corners of the earth of people demanding to be noticed, to be appreciated, to be uh, understood. Um, people who've been neglected, their needs have not been met, you know, and not just the starving people and the hurting people and, you know, with the uh, lack of nutrition, just basic needs, you know, lack of homes and um, health care and education. I mean, we, we know, we've always known these people need our help, but <laughs> we're very slow on taking care of them because of this greed that's sucking up all the resources and the money and not sharing. Maitreya's big message to us is to learn to share. But the other people who have been feeling neglected, you know, the or mistreated, you know, the black people, the gay people, the Native Americans, the, you know, the disenfranchised, the handicapped, you know, every single person in every single group in the whole world seems to be demanding to be noticed and taken care of. And I think this is a really necessary step towards our learning brotherhood, which is the keynote of the coming time, the coming age of Aquarius. So these are really good things, in my opinion, and they point to this change which is upon us. And you don't hear any of this stuff on the news, so it's good to keep this in mind when you're wanting to stress out. These are growing pains, in my opinion. Um, and the last thing is that, you know, the, the truth has pretty much flown the coop. <laughs> you can't go anywhere and be sure you have the truth about anything, which I find <laughs> pretty funny, actually, and frustrating at the same time, because you don't know on what to count, you know? Um, so many people are manipulating the airwaves and the computer waves and the, you know, the mass media. It's just insane, really, trying to figure out what to believe. Um, we have so many big decisions to make and we just don't know where to turn. And I think that's a beautiful thing because what it's doing is helping us develop our intuition, which I think is also a big step on the spiritual path is to develop this inner knowing, this inner intuition, and to not rely on outer signs and outer information. It's just a, you know, meditation. This is why I 
I always promote meditating because it, I believe that all of our answers are within and we just have to learn to tap that inner resource. And so I just think this is a great opportunity to tap your inner knowing and, and learn to figure it, um, some of these things out by just going within because there's a big bunch of knowledge in there and wisdom and creativity. So let's see what else I got. <laughs> I'm almost at the end. You can go to uh, read some articles I wrote. There's 10, I think 10 or 12, 10 articles I wrote on the subject of the world teacher. Um, and they're illustrated and they're entertaining and it's called the Oh My God series. It's OMG series dot something. I will, I will find it. Um, I'll put the link. So thank you for listening. If you've gotten this far. <laughs> I think the goal of, of getting people to center, to medicate, medicate, meditate and calm down is very important because a lot of the weaker links in the chain are snapping and people are flipping, particularly in the States. And when they do, it's dangerous. Well, it's a lot of suicides, you know, young people committing suicide. We're really in a big trauma right now. There's so much stress. I just feel it so powerfully. And I feel like that's part of my whole service work right now is to make people feel happier, give them a reason to live, give them a reason to hope, give them an understanding that there's a, a, a path that is being followed right now in order to get us into the new age and their growing pains. You know, I, for me, if I didn't know this stuff about Maitreya, all these establishments we've held in high esteem are just rife with corruption. And this has been going on for like 30 years or 40 years since I've been paying attention to it. That's one of the reasons why I, I got connected with this because I started to see these patterns in the world of all this sort of junk coming to the surface. And I just know that we are making this movement and it's really painful to have the veils being lifted on all of our seedy behavior, you know? So I, I just, uh, and that's why I also wrote those articles because I wanted to just give people some frame of reference for what's going on if they don't know this information, because it would be so heartbreaking to think it's just a mad free for all in the world right now. So we will put a link to the Oh My God series up on the screen okay. so our audience can go there and read them. Mm -hmm. And just to reiterate what I said earlier, you're doing work, Gina, not just to entertain and create a feast for the eyes, but you want to uplift people. You want okay. to enlighten people. You want to make their lives easier and help them look at the bigger picture Put in contact, uh, in context, the chaos in the world and see that it's temporary, that they don't need to personalize it, and they and we will make it through. Yes, that's very well said, uh, David. Thank you. I, I'm always struck when I read Benjamin Krem's master's messages at the beginning of every Share International magazine. Uh, there's a message. Uh, by Benjamin Krem's mas master and his breadth of vision is so beautiful and it just stops my heart, you know, um, stop my breathing, I guess I should say, not my heart, uh, because it's just it, the overview of the plan for humanity is right there on the page and it's just, it helps me so much. And so I'm trying to do that on a little mini scale, you know, from the small bit of this information that I know, because I know a lot of people 
I think are getting more and more hungry for this spiritual information. Things are changing drastically, but it's scary, you know, for a lot of people. So I was just trying to lighten it up with those Oh My God series articles because I was trying to find some humor in it. And uh, anyway. Well, in addition to the OMG series, you brought up something else important, which I've neglected to mention, and that is Share International Magazine, mm -hmm. which was begun in 1982. I started getting them in 2002 or 2001, and it's the one magazine I never throw out. Right. There's, there's no advertising, and as Gina has pointed out, in each one of them, there's either, well, there wasn't up until... Ben transitioned in 2016, there was a message from the master every month. And after 2016, they are still putting messages from the master in each of the issues, plus all kinds of articles about what's going on in the world, but from a more broad-minded, spiritual, and I don't mean religious, and loving perspective. And I'm so I'm glad you mentioned that, Gina. And I'm wondering, has your work shown up in Share International Magazine in the past? Uh, my artwork? No. Yes. <laughs> well, I think it's time. Well, you know, I just, I don't know. I don't even know how to answer that. My my experiences of, you know, my train and the Master Jesus visiting me have shown up when I've written a couple letters to Benjamin Kremt, who's the editor. And his master confirmed that these experiences were uh, visits from Maitreya or the Master Jesus. So that's pretty cool. Well, before we go, then describe them to our audience and perhaps they can relate to them. <laughs> Try to figure out what, I don't know why my brain just, is shutting off. There's pick, pick one, just, anyone. There's a simple one of... Um, I was working a booth uh, with a young guy who was new to our meditation group, our, our spiritual group, and we were doing a booth at a, a New Age festival, and we were talking about Maitreya and this story about the emergence of Maitreya and the Masters. And I had, uh, we had a, a book that had photographs of the various miracles that were going on in the world that we believe point to this moment as happening and this person walked up to the uh to the booth the table and I just started doing my little spiel <laughs> you know showing these things I was barely looking up I was just going this you know this rote thing and he was standing there I think just kind of his hands clasped in front of him um and he was so quiet and so peaceful. I finally realized that's weird. <laughs> Not like a normal person, you know. <laughs> and I finally looked up and he didn't say anything. I said, well, if you don't say anything, I'll just keep going. <laughs> and he said, well, when people talk, I like to listen. <laughs> Which, of course, was a sign for me to shut up because, you know, I'm too wordy. <laughs> and masters, when they give you experiences like this, they're often giving you a little teaching at the same time. <laughs> so so I didn't really hear what he said, you know, of course. And I just went on with my little spiel. And while I was doing that, the young man uh, at the table with me just backed up and sort of fell into his chair and then this nice person who very quiet and everything, he, when I was done with my spiel, he looked at me and he said, you're doing a great job, keep it up. And then he walked away. And I thought, that's pretty weird. What, you know, regular person coming to a booth like that says, you know, you're doing a great job, keep it up. That's just like weird. And so I, you know, of course, wrote to Share International and Benjamin Krem's master said that that was the master Jesus. And my young associate, uh, you know, felt his 
the master Jesus's energy so strongly right away. And he just like fell into his chair. <laughs> so, and I was being oblivious because I was just on some big, you know, rant. So that was an interesting experience. And um, I've had quite a few others, but. And, um, and, and as you mentioned, Gina, you wrote into Share International Magazine mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. Benjamin Krem, we mentioned the author, artist, and esotericist, was the editor at that time. And these letters were given to him, and he shared it with the master of wisdom that mm -hmm. overshadowed him, that he had developed a moment-by-moment -moment telepathic rapport with over several years. Right, right. And sometimes they would share that with another master and get feedback and find out whether the person that Gina spoke to at that booth was someone unusual. And as you said, Ben, Benjamin Krem did indeed confirm that in this case, it was the master Jesus who came to your table and spoke to you. Right. Amazing. And there's many, many stories like that from people all over the world. And they, it must have been really exhilarating too. Well, yeah, of course. I mean, the weird part is I was so obsessed with my own routine that I can't even remember what he looked like. I just, I think he had like on a light pink shirt, but I do remember his energy very powerfully and his crispness, like his clothes were so perfect, like perfectly ironed and perfectly fitting. And I mean, there's this radiance of perfection, which I've heard other people describe also when having an experience of the Master Jesus, and and I've experienced it uh, other times too. So it's very interesting. And if our audience is wondering why these occur, well, if you're involved in this type of work, the emergence work, as we call it, the emergence of the world teacher Maitreya and his group, the Masters of Wisdom, for the first time in 98,000 years, then workers like Gina and myself, co-workers in this work, need some encouragement. And so <laughs> from time to time, the mm -hmm. Masters of Wisdom will provide that because they know that humanity today is nowhere near as naive and gullible and uneducated as we were thousands of years ago. Mm -hmm. And so we need to go on more than just belief. And there, Gina, you had your proof. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> and with that, I would hope that we can have you back on again, Gina. You've got so much artwork and so many stories that we can make a series just out of your work. And I would encourage people who are watching this show to go to Gina's website and check out her work and watch her videos including the OMG, Oh My God series. I got a big kick out of it and learned <laughs> something. And if you're an artist like me, or you're interested in art, or you want to get started, she's an educator too, whether she knows it or not. So, so thank you so much, Gina. We really appreciate you spending so much of your time and energy on presenting your story to us and the world. And we hope to see you again here on Planetary Makeover. Thank you so much, David. You're most welcome, Gina. And we'll say to you and to everyone out there, bye for now, and we hope to see you again soon. If you enjoyed this show, please subscribe, hit the like button, and share this video with your friends. We appreciate your comments, and we respond to them.